apologize that this audio isn't great. Again, I'm having to record in a different place without my studio. Let's talk about disjointness, which I don't even know if that's a word. Anyway, we're going to talk about disjoint and non-disjoint um, outcomes. So we've talked about an event. An event is a, a process, usually a random process, that can produce more than one possible outcome. And then those outcomes, we focus on those quite a lot. Let's focus on them. Outcomes that cannot happen together, that just logically or physically or whatever, by definition, cannot happen together, we call those disjoint. They're disjoint from each other, so this is something that only applies to groups of outcomes, not to an individual outcome. Disjointness doesn't make any sense unless we're talking about it uh, in relationship between two or more outcomes. And, uh, I <laughs> just got a little bit stuck there. So we can divide all the event types that we that we can think of, all the events or processes, um, and their outcomes into disjoint outcomes or events. Now you'll you'll hear me flip flopping events and outcomes because once you have an outcome, that outcome itself can become an event, and so those definitions are pretty slippery sometimes. They depend on your focus. So you can have disjoint events or disjoint outcomes or non-disjoint. So a disjoint event or outcome. There are some some, some uh, examples of that. Rolling a 1 on a die and rolling a 4 on the same die on the same roll. That can't happen. You can only roll one of those things. So rolling a 1 and rolling a 4 under those conditions, those are disjoint outcomes or disjoint events. Being over 40 and under 40 years old at the same time, you can't. Passing a, a test in school and failing a test in school, you can't do those things. In some Zen Buddhist martial arts movie way, you can, but that's actually sort of a philosophical, conceptual, different thing. In reality, no, you can't. Having an IQ of 100 and an IQ of 120, you can't have those at the same time. Your particular IQ is measured as exactly what it is. You can't have them both at the same time. Non-disjoint outcomes, like rolling a 1 and a 4 on two dice, of course, that can happen. It doesn't have to happen, but it can. Uh, you could have a 1 on one die and a 4 on the other die. You could be over 40 and you could be out of shape. Both of those outcomes can happen. You could pass a test and also have a hamster. You could have an IQ of 100 and a nice car, etc. So though, having that distinction helps us to figure out some, some um, probabilities. And knowing that distinction is critical for certain types of probabilities. You have to understand whether events are disjoint to know which rules of probability to apply. So as an example, let's go back to a simple probability. You've seen it before. Drawing a jack out of a deck of cards on a single draw of one card. So are these four possibilities disjoint? Yeah, they are, because you can only draw one of them. In fact, they're disjoint from every other card draw that you might that you might draw. So the number of outcomes of interest, just to work this problem all the way through, there are four possible things that could happen that we're interested in here. Four jacks, and there are 52 outcomes. So we divide that, and we get about 0.08. That's the probability of drawing a jack. Winning a raffle ticket if you have 10 tickets. So there's one winner, there's 500 tickets sold. Is winning a disjoint outcome for the 10 tickets? It is because only one of the tickets can win if there's only one winner. If ticket number one wins, then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, they can't win. In fact, it's disjoint from the winning of any given ticket of all 500. Any, any one of those 500 winning is disjoint from all other of those 500 tickets winning because only one of those things can happen. No two can ever happen in this situation. So figuring this out is pretty easy. You have 10 tickets and there's 500 tickets sold. So there are 10 outcomes of interest, total possible outcomes, any one of the 500 tickets might win. The probability of you winning is 0.02. So randomly selecting, yeah, this is just me being silly. I don't even want to think about whether it's disjoint or not. Sometimes you get a probability of 1.0. So the probability of this is kind of interesting because what it will lead into. The probability that the next person you meet will have the same birthday as you. If you like, assume that people are born equally distributed across the days of the year, then you can figure that out by taking the outcomes of interest, which is 1. So the next person you meet, let's assume, as far as you know, they could have been born on any random day of the year, but your birthday is one specific thing. So there's only one way that you can find a match. There's 365 possibilities, but only one of those is a match for your birthday. So it's below 0.01, it's 0.0027. 
about one quarter of one percent probability, more or less. So that's a fairly simple thing to figure out. But now think about this one. What's the probability of any two people in a group having the same birthday as each other? This is a famous problem in probability. It's called the birthday paradox, or sometimes the birthday problem. When people try and think through this, and go ahead and pause this and think through it and see if you can come up with the answer. When people try and think through this, they generally tend to think that this is a much simpler problem than it actually is. If you've encountered this before, and some of you might have, it's a popular problem, then you'll have an idea of how the solution works. Uh, if you haven't, then see if you can figure it out and then see how close you were to the answer. So the probability of at least one person in a group having your birthday is uh, the probability of, you know, Alice in the group being born on your birthday, Bob, so or, or Bob being born on your birthday, or Charles being born on your birthday. So you would add those probabilities together. So that's easy. But at least two people having the same birthday, by the way, you don't have to learn this, um, gets more complicated. One of the ways to figure this out is to say, what's well, the probability of no two people having the same birthday, and then take one minus that probability, because that's the way not works, and we'll see that in a, a later lecture. So what's the probability of none of this stuff being true? What's the probability of not Alice being not the same as Bob, Alice being not the same as Charlie? So let's assume there's six people in the group, Alice, um, Bob, Charlie, Darla, Edna, and Frank. Um, so what's the probability of none of these things being true? Actually, I might have an extra knot in there. Anyway, you have to figure out all those possibilities, and you have to figure out, and you have to factor in the fact that if one person matches or doesn't match, then the probabilities are now changed for everybody else in the group. So there's no simple rule to do this. Uh, using some funky math concepts, you can, uh, sort of funky, you can get a relatively simple equation to figure this out. But working it through brute force logic takes a bit of calculation. So I'll show you how the results look depending on the size of the group. This is the chart. Now on the x-axis here you see the number of people in a group and then the, the lines represent two different probabilities. The blue line, as the numbers, in the, uh, numbers of people in the group increase, this is the probability of at least one person in the group having your birthday. So when you get up to 200, you're still not even at 0.5 probability. You're still not at 50%. So the probability of one person in the group having a specific birthday on a specific date that grows pretty slowly with the, with the size of the group. However, look at this red line. This is the line that shows you how the probabilities grow of any two people in the group having the same birthday. The reason that grows so fast is because there are so many ways it could happen. And the more people are in the group, the more ways there are it could happen. But if there are only two people in the group, there's only one way it can happen. They have to have the same birthday. If there are three people, now there are three ways. A could be the same as B, B is C, or A is C. If you have five people, now there's a whole bunch. So those numbers grow geometrically, um, the number of ways it can happen. And so when you get up to 40 people in a group, the probability that at least two of them will have the same birthday becomes almost 0.9, almost a 9 out of 10 chance. 45 people, it's above 9 out of 10, it's 0.94. 50 people, it's 0.97, which is, this is a pretty sweet bet. And then 60 people, it's above 0.99, it's above 99%. So now I've corrupted you with statistics. So just skipping ahead, we're going to talk about two separate concepts, two separate issues with events or outcomes. The disjoint versus non-disjoint, and there's two separate rules that we use for, for finding out the probability of A or B happening. There are two different versions of the addition rule, the specific addition rule and the general addition rule, but we're not going to worry about the general one because I don't want to make this class all about probability. And then independent versus dependent, and there are two separate versions of the multiplication rule, which tells you the probability of A and B happening in the same frame of reference. And we're only going to learn the specific one again. We're not going to learn the general one. And that's